Hello, welcome to the NABA chat on Zoom. I'm Jeannie Horton, the Vice President of NABA. It's great to see all of you, all the different chapters and different regions represented. Also represented our staff and board members of NABA. I wanna recognize Stacy Cohen. She's the new Executive Director for NABA. I see Laura Bianco. She is the Office Manager for NABA. And Mike Cherboni is the NABA Administrator. I see Jim Springer from the Board of Directors and a few other names that you'll recognize. And I'm so pleased that you could join us tonight. Tonight, we are so pleased to have with us Luciano Guerra, and he is the outreach coordinator, the photographer and educator for the NABA owned National Butterfly Center in Mission, Texas. He's been an avid photographer ever since he got that first 35 millimeter camera as a teenager. He loves sharing this incredible, the incredible diversity of the Rio Grande Valley in images captured through his lenses. His photos and videos have been seen in Texas Monthly, on CNN, and in the National Butterfly Center's social media. After Luciano speaks, we will have a short period of Q&A. So post your questions in the chat area, and we will uh, go through and, and curate all of those questions towards the end. But if you would for now, mute your sound and welcome with me, Luciano. Welcome to NABA Chat. Hi, Jeannie. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, welcome, everybody. I understand we have a pretty big group tonight. Uh, it's been said there's safety in numbers. We'll find out if that's true or not tonight. This is actually my first Zoom presentation, and I'm starting off big here. So just thank you all for, for, for tuning in uh, to my program, which I'm calling Eye of the Butterfly, Macro Photography Exposed, Tips and Secrets That Won't Make You Shudder. As you're soon to find out, maybe you just did, I do like to add some humor to my programs and to use puns. And that's what I did right there, of course. But what we're going to be doing tonight, uh, we're going to be going over some of the basics and principles of macro photography. For some of you, some of this may be uh, a little bit too basic. Others of you may be a little bit too advanced. Uh, there's such a wide range of people in the audience tonight that there's no way I can address everybody individually, but uh, feel free to ask me questions afterwards. I'll stick around. Uh, one question, which I'm gonna answer right now says, no, you cannot have my job, okay? I am the photographer at the National Butterfly Center and it's it's a dream job. Many people have told me that when I retire, oh, we know it. It works they want it. my job. Yeah. Well, I'm not We're planning on retiring yeah. anytime soon. Yeah. And yeah. I think Mariana Cervino yeah. Wright, if you're listening in, I hope you've made note of that, okay? Uh, anyway, I hope those of you that have been to the National Butterfly Center before may have met me already. I recognize some of the names already and some of the faces that I'm seeing. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm not sure exactly how long this is going to take. Uh, I've never actually gone through this program all the way through, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, first of all, I did decide to call it Eye of the Butterfly because, of course, we're talking about macro photography and the eye is the most important part of the insect or your subject to get sharp to get in focus i could have called it eyes of the butterfly or i could have called it eyes of the damselfly we even could have called it butt of the fly but i kind of decided against that one and stuck with eye of the butterfly now what is macro photography Macrophotography is close-up photography, usually a very small subject. While the term macro is oftentimes used to describe any close focusing lens, a true macro lens is classically capable of reproduction ratio, ratios of at least one to one on the slide negative or image sensor. What this means is, for those of you that remember slide film, uh, a film or a slide or, or negatives, when you take a picture of a, of a subject, if it's the same size in real life as it is on your slide negative or sensor, that is a one-to-one -one reproduction ratio. If it's half size, it's going to be one-to-two. If it's double the size, it's going to be two-to-one. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about reproduction ratios, how large the subject is on your sensor of your camera, because I'm sure... Most of you, I'm sure all of you are using digital cameras. I don't think anybody is still using film, although some people may be. 
But that's what true macro photography is, okay? What is an image sensor? A camera sensor is a piece of hardware inside the camera that captures light and converts it into signals, which result in an image. All our cameras have sensors in them, and the sensor has basically replaced the film. Sensors consist of millions of photosites or light sensitive spots that record what is being seen through the lens. Due to advances in sensor technology, today's small sensor digital cameras can rival the macro capabilities of a DSLR, which is a digital single lens reflex camera with a true macro lens. Now, lens. Single lens reflex means it's a camera that you can remove the lens and put another, attach another, another lens to it. This makes macro photography more widely accessible at a lower cost. Now we're gonna discuss equipment and techniques. Macro lenses are specifically designed for close up work with a long barrel for close focusing and are optimized for high reproduction ratios. Remember, we talked about reproduction ratios already. They are one of the most common tools for macro photography. Most macro lenses can focus continuously to infinity and provide excellent optical quality for normal photography. Uh, I'm sorry, but the very top of my screen is being blocked by a bar. I can't see that top line on there. Anything we can do that about, Jeannie? How, how do I remove that bar that goes across the top? Anyway, uh, it's possible with true macro, it's possible to photograph the structure of small insect eyes, the scales on butterfly wings, and other minuscule objects, like my brain. <laughs> Little humor there. Okay, uh, many, I'm sorry, I can't read that top line. Oh, Luciano, did that take it out or did that make it better? No, it's still, it's still the same. I still see that bar across the top, which is mute, stop video. Yeah. Okay, sorry about play, this, folks. Let me play with that for a minute. Okay. I put my text too close to the top. I'll, I'll read whatever they say. That's what he's talking about. You don't have to say. I did the best I could. Is there a knob on the speaker? I don't know where the speaker is. Right there. The black thing that's giving you the sound. I'm trying to see what I can do to change that. Now, hopefully I won't have too many slides like this where the text is all the way to the top. Let me see. Hide thumbnail, you show small actual speaker. First line reads macro lenses of different. Okay. Macro lenses of different focal lengths find different uses and offer different working distances. For example, the, the the first the top line for for what's that top line say? First line reads forty five dash sixty five mm dash right. product. Right, it, those are used for photography of small or small inanimate objects. Ninety to one hundred five millimeter lenses are for insects, flowers, and small objects from a comfortable distance, and one hundred fifty to two hundred millimeter lenses are used for insects and other small animals where additional working distance is required. Okay, here we have a little diagram showing different lenses on these cameras. The first one is a short focal length lens. It has a very small working distance, very short. You have to get pretty close to your subject, which can not, you cannot, cannot always do, like with butterflies or something else that may fly away. A medium focal length lens, which I'm pointing to right now, has a little bit more working distance. And a long lens, a long telephoto lens, has a lot more working distance. A lot of people use the longer lenses for dragonflies and butterflies and things like that that maybe will not let you get any closer to them. 
Top line, please. First line reads, a lens's focal length not only not only affects its working distance, but it also greatly affects the image's background due to its angle of view. The longer a lens is, the narrower its angle of view, and the more control you will have over your backgrounds. Okay, what we're talking about here, if you look to the left where the camera is, this first section here is ultra wide angle lenses. They have a very wide angle of view. The, then you have wide angle, standard, telephoto, and super telephoto. The longer the lens is, the narrower the angle of view. Why is this important? It's because you really have to watch your backgrounds when it comes to, to macro photography or any kind of photography. And with a wider angle of view, it's more difficult to eliminate something in the background that may be distracting. So if you Luciana, have a longer... I hate to yes? interrupt, but I think if you move your mouse on your computer, it'll change your view of the screen because we can read your slides. So okay. if I move my mouse where? If you just okay. slide it down to the bottom of the page, okay. it should take that bar off. Maybe not. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. So what you have here is, I'll just stop moving it. I'll use the arrow key, see if that stops it. Uh, so what you want to do is control your backgrounds. And you have a longer lens, you'll have much more control over your backgrounds. Okay. Here's another way to demonstrate that. Here we have a, the sensor or your cameras on the right. Your lens is represented by that pink line. And it shows your angle of view with the subject to the left. Imagine moving that lens further away from the sensor. What's going to happen? The angle of view is going to shrink. So the more you move the lens away from the sensor, the narrower the angle of, of view, okay? Which is a good thing. Top line, sorry. You have the top line? Top line reads, the use of extension tubes which attach between the camera body and the lens is a popular option for turning a non-macro lens into a macro lens. These tubes function by extending the distance between the lens and the film or sensor. Here's a set of extension tubes, okay? They're basically hollow tubes. There's nothing in them. There's no glass or anything in them. And all extension tubes do is move your lens away from the camera body or away from your sensor. The further away, and actually you're doing, you're moving the glass elements within the, the lens away from the sensor. The more you move the elements away, the more the camera is able to focus up close. Now I have a set of extension tubes here. These are the ones I use. As you see, there's nothing in there and there's three of them, okay? And that's what you're seeing there on the screen as well. Here it shows how the, how the uh, extension tubes attach to the camera body, and then you attach the lens to the extension tubes. You can, uh, I have a little more information here. Extension tubes come in various thicknesses ranging from eight millimeter to 35 millimeter. They are usually sold as sets of three tubes of three different lengths. For example, 12, mil 12 millimeter, 20 millimeter and 36 millimeter, which is exactly what I have here. Top line, I can't read. Top line reads, these tubes can be used individually or stacked in any combination to ob obtain the desired magnification. This is my 12 millimeter tube. It's very, very narrow. I can put that on here and here I have my 20 millimeter, and here I have my 36 millimeter, okay? Now, the greater the extension is and the shorter the lens they are mounted on, the closer the focusing distance is and the greater the magnification. So the more extension you put between your body and the lens, you'll be able to focus closer, but your working distance will also be minimized. So there is a positive and there is a negative to putting more extension between your body and your lens. Here we have a flow showing the scales with a 12 millimeter extension tube attached to my camera. Here we have it with a 20 
millimeter extension tube attached. As you can tell, it's larger scales. Somebody's drawing on my screen. Uh, here we have a 36 millimeter extension tube showing the scales are even larger. And here we have a combination of all three extension tubes. You can see all the scales on the wings. So this is what you can do. Extension tubes could turn a non-macro lens into a macro lens. Because basically, a macro lens, the way it works, it, it, the glass elements are able to move further away from the sensor within the lens. So if you have a normal lens, it's not a macro lens, the only way to get elements further away from the sensor than how it was manufactured is to add extension tubes. Okay, don't worry, don't worry about that. Okay, extension tubes, what's the top line? Extension tubes eliminate. Eliminate your lens's ability to focus at a distance. The more extension you place between your camera and your lens, the more your lens's ability to focus at a distance is minimized. Okay, <laughs> let's say you're out taking pictures with your with your camera and you got extension tubes on your on your on your camera. You see a pretty butterfly. You're taking its pictures. All of a sudden, you see a bobcat out in the distance. You will not be able to take its picture. Why? Because your camera can no longer focus at a distance as long as extension tubes are mounted. Okay. You cannot focus to infinity, and the more extension you put on your camera, the more extension tubes, the less you'll be able to focus at a distance. So it does have its uh, drawbacks. So you cannot use it while a normal macro lens, a, a, a true macro lens, can focus to infinity. It can focus up close, which is great. But true macro lenses are expensive, and if you don't want to go out and buy a new lens, and you wanted to be able to do more macro photography, look into extension tubes. Top line. Extension tubes can also be. It can also be used to enable, enable macro lenses to focus even closer. If you have a macro lens already and you want to make it focus even closer than it's able to on its own, use extension tubes. Combine extension tubes with a true macro lens for those extremely small subjects. Here's a butterfly egg. Here's another egg. You know, you guys know how tiny butterfly eggs are, right? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure this is a gulf fritillary on, on passion vine. Here's another egg. Here's a caterpillar that just eclosed, just emerged from the egg. I used a true macro lens with extension tubes to be able to focus this close. Top line. Reads, extension tubes are? Sometimes confused with teleconverters. Unlike extension tubes, which are hollow, teleconverters contain glass elements that increase the effective focal length of lenses they are mounted on, usually by 1.4x or 2x. Some of you may already have teleconverters, especially if you're a birder and you have a lens that you want to make it stronger than it actually is. You want to turn maybe a 300 millimeter lens into a 600 millimeter lens. How do you do that? You use a 2X converter, okay? Now, here's a teleconverter. It has glass inside it. It's not hollow like the tube is, okay? Now, these do work for macro because basically you are increasing your image by 1.4X or 2X. So it is in a way of making a non-macro lens have more macro capabilities, but it's going to be more expensive because it's got glass in it. And also, the more glass you put between your subject and your image sensor, especially if it's cheap glass, if it's glass that uh, it's a it's a it's 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 a it, it you know if it's not a name brand teleconverter, that can actually have a negative effect on your images. Top line. Placing an auxiliary close-up. Lens or close-up filter in front of the camera's lens is another option. Inexpensive screw-in or slip-on attachments provide close focusing. This is a close-up lens. It's basically like putting a magnifying glass in front of your lens. 
it magnifies the image coming into the lens. Okay. They usually come in sets of three like this. And they're, they're rather inexpensive, really pretty inexpensive. But the problem is that sometimes they're not the best quality. If you are going to go with these, get the best, the, the, the best brand you can get. Do some research because you want that glass to be as good quality as possible. And this is something that just screws on to the front of your lens and it automatically makes the image larger. Top line. Increasingly, macro. Photography is accomplished using compact digital cameras and small sensor bridge cameras combined with a high powered zoom lens. Here we have compact cameras on the top and bridge cameras on the bottom. Chances are that most of you have one of these two options. Some of you may also have a DSLR like I have. Bridge cameras is basically called, is called, called bridge cameras because they're a bridge between the compact cameras and the DSLRs. There's something that falls in between. Now, these have amazing lenses and some of these you can zoom way more than I can with my DSLR. Uh, but they are maybe not going to have the same quality images because they are smaller cameras and they are smaller sensors. But there's nothing wrong with using some of these for macro photography, especially if they have a macro mode already built in. Top line. Well, most of these. Cameras come with a macro mode, which does not qualify as true macro. Some photographers are using the advantages of small sensor cameras to create macro images that rival those from DSLRs. So you can use uh, small sensor cameras to do some really amazing camera you know, macro photography. Now, what is a small sensor camera? It's also called a crop sensor by some people. Here you have an image. Now, the green is a full frame sensor. It's basically the same as a 35 millimeter frame. The crop sensor is the red, that's a small sensor. What you're doing is just because it's already basically cropping out, everything between the red and the green lines is being cropped out by your sensor. So it's almost making your lens a longer focal length lens. For example, if you have a 300 millimeter lens, for film, you put it on a camera with a small sensor, it multiplies the focal length of that lens by one and a half. So that 300 millimeter lens becomes a 450 millimeter lens. And that's what crop sensors do, which is, oh, that's great. I can get a larger lens without even have to, without having to buy another lens. And that's actually, I do use a small sensor lens my, uh, camera myself. But there are some disadvantages to it. Uh, the, and, and, and that's something I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. Blind. Smaller sensors apply. Cropping to lenses while larger sensors can capture much more of the scene. The full frame sensor is your traditional 35 millimeter film. So don't worry about it if you have a small sensor camera. Uh, first of all, they're not gonna be as expensive as a full sensor camera. And uh, they're going to be smaller, not as large, and so on. And there's definite advantages to going with a small sensor as opposed to a full frame sensor camera. Top line. A camera's sensor not only determines image size, but also the depth of field, low light performance, a camera's physical size, resolution, and more. So there are a lot of things that are affected by the size of the sensor. Okay, now here's a few of my macro photos. I know I got a lot of text for you guys to read and follow along. So I'm gonna show you some of my photos. Take a little break here from all the text. Okay, here's a house fly. Here's two flies. One giving the other a piggyback ride. Here we have a jumping spider. I love photographing jumping spiders. Macro photography, they make great subjects. Here's another jumping spider, as you can tell right there. Look at its eyes, look at its fangs, look at all the little hairs on its legs. One thing I love about macro photography, they will show subjects in a whole new light. 
most people have seen jumping spiders and just you just they see them and don't really pay much attention to them. But look at it up close like this, and you'll see all those details. It 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 just makes them that much more interesting when you can get up and close, up close and personal with them, like I did here. Okay. Now we're going to discuss depth of field. How are we doing the time? Okay. Depth of field. Can you read the top line, please? Top line. Depth of field, DOF, is the right. distance between the nearest and farthest objects in a scene that appear acceptably sharp in an image. Okay, here we have a shot of barbed wire fence. You notice how the barb in the middle is in focus, but none of the other barbs are in focus. Why not? It's because this was taken at a very shallow depth of field. Your uh, depth of field is basically that barb and a little bit on each side of it. All these other ones are out of focus. If you have a deeper depth of field, greater depth of field, you'd have more of those barbs be in focus than just the one. This is how depth of field works, okay? Top line. Although a lens can. Precisely focus at only one distance at a time, the decrease in sharpness is gradual on each side of the focus distance. So it's 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 like it's a gradual blurriness. Yes, it's focusing on that one barb, but it's a little bit on each side of it. It looks in focus, even though it's a little bit out of focus. Now, this is a typical lens that goes on a DSLR camera. Now, if you've ever used these lenses, you see all these numbers and so on, you probably know what the numbers 2, 2.8, 4, what they represent. They represent the aperture, okay? That's the diaphragm opening. When you're shooting, you have, you have the aperture, you have the shutter speed, you have the ISO. Those are three different things you can change. You can, on your camera or on your lens, to affect the amount of light coming in. But do you know what those numbers are directly above the apertures? Okay, those are also apertures. As you see, they relate 11, 16, 22. That is a depth of field scale. Read the top line, please. The DOF scale below the? Before the below the distance scales in, includes markings on either side of the index that correspond to f-stops. When the lens is set to a given f-stop, the depth of field extends between the distances that align with the f-stop markings. Or for example, let's say, since you see a little white dot or the number 11, this lens is set for f11. If you look up to the uh, depth of field scale, you see one on the left, one on the right. What that's showing you is approximately how deep the depth of field is. If you, if you go to f16, your depth of field increases. If you go to f22, your depth of field increases even more. At f22, this lens can focus from about 0 0.8 millimeters, 0 0.8 meters to infinity. Okay, so that depth of field scale is something you can use to estimate what the final picture is going to look like in regards to depth of field. Now, when you stop, this is what's happening in your lens. The aperture, the diaphragm is opening at 2.8, it's wide open. At F16, it's closed. And I don't know what the you know scientific principle is, but when you shoot with a lens wide open, you're going to get more light coming in, but you're going to get very shallow depth of field. If you shoot with when you shoot, when you stop down to F16, for example, you see that little hole right there, it's letting a little bit of light in. It's only letting a little bit of light in, but your depth of field increases. So if you're trying to increase your depth of field because you need to get more subject in focus, try stopping down your lens to a higher f-stop. Top line. A small aperture, parenthesis, high f dash stop, close parenthesis. Right, it's often required to produce <clears throat> acceptable sharpness across a three-dimensional subject. This requires either a slow shutter speed brilliant lighting, or a high ISO. Auxiliary lighting, such as from a flash unit, is often used, okay? Top line. Limited DOF is an important consideration in macro photography. 
DOF depth of field is extremely shallow when focusing on closed subjects. Here we have another jumping spider. You can tell its eyes are in focus, its fangs are in focus, but look at the legs directly in front of it. That's only a few millimeters difference between the eyes and the legs, yet the legs are not in focus. Why? Very shallow depth of field. And that's one thing with extension tubes you have to work around. Extremely limited depth of field. Here we have, uh, I believe it's a fiery skipper. Look at its face. Look at that. You can see the little pollen granules on its little hairs and look at its eyes. Everything's perfectly focused. Everything that's on that same focal plane. But look at the antennas. At the base of the antennas, they're in focus. But look at the tips or the clubs. They're out of focus. It's a gradual from the base to the, to the clubs. Why? Because they are not on the same focal plane. And that's why with extremely shallow depth of field, when you get into macro, you got to get those eyes in focus. The rest is not that important. If you get the eyes in focus, that will make it make a big, big difference. Top line. The extremely shallow DOF. In macro photography makes it essential to focus critically on the most important part of the subject. As elements that are even a millimeter closer or farther from the focal plane might be noticeably blurred. Here we have another jumping spider. I told you I like photographing jumping spiders. Notice its eyes, look at the hairs on its head, look at its fangs, those are all in focus. Look at the legs off to the sides, not the front ones, but the middle legs, they're in focus too. Why? Because they're on the same focal plane as the eyes. When I focused on the eyes, I also focused on those legs. But the legs in front, they're blurry. Why? Because they're on a different focal plane. My depth of field was so shallow that I could not get those legs in focus and still get the eyes in focus. So I had to make a decision. Do I want the eyes in focus? Do I want the legs in focus? I want the eyes. Always go for the eyes. One thing, a tool you might be able to use because focusing is so critical, critical when macro photography is a focusing rail. Basically, the camera mounts on that pad there with a little, little screw on the bottom, attaches it. And you attach that to a tripod, and then you can move your camera by millimeters at a time, forward or back. That's for very critical focusing. But for these to work, you have to have it on a camera on a tripod. Here's a focusing rail that not only lets you move your lens, your camera, forward and back by millimeters, it allows you to move your camera side to side by millimeters as well. Okay. Now, was this at the top? A, a more a, a much very, cheaper focusing rail. A, a much you. cheaper focusing rail. You, the rocking technique is ideal when shooting handheld or with a camera resting on a bean bag for stability. It's a, it's tiny back and forth movements. They're essentially a more manual version of using a focusing rail. We're talking about hand holding here. Okay. When gently rocking, you you wait for the subject to appear sharp in the viewfinder and release the shutter at this point. Why do I have to do this? I have autofocus. I can just press a button and I'm focused on it. Well, when you're doing macro photography, let's say you're photographing a, a, a butterfly or something with, with very shallow depth of field. Focusing on it, yes, maybe the autofocus will let you get close, but not exact. Then what you do, don't keep using your autofocus. Once you get close to the right focus point, move yourself forward or back until you see the subject is sharp in the viewfinder. Then you take the picture. It's rocking back and forth, and you're moving your camera forward and back until you get it in focus, and then you take the picture. Shooting continuous shooting or burst mode can also improve your hit rate. So take a burst of photos. When you're doing macro photography, if you're doing something very critical and something you may never see again, or maybe not get quite that shot that you really like, take a burst of photos because just snapping the, the, uh, the shutter on that can make your camera move a little bit. So take a burst of photos and then you can pick the best one and delete the rest. Here we have, I use the rocking back and forth uh, 
system to, to shoot this. Now, of course, it's not a focus, is it? But look at the leaf on top. This is a jumping spider that kind of sandwiches itself between two, leaf, uh, between two leaves that formed a web there. The edge of that top leaf is perfectly in focus, but the spider is not. So what did I do? I had to rock forward or rock back until I got the spider in focus. There we go. Now, the top edge of the leaf is out of focus, but that doesn't matter. Nobody's going to look at the top edge of the leaf. They're going to look at that spider. So rocking back and forth, even if you have an autofocus lens, don't worry about that. Move it back and forth until you get the subject in focus and then take a burst of photos. Top line. Focus stacking is a technique. Designed to achieve a deep depth of field by blending or stacking several images together. Focus okay. stacking. Oops. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Focus stacking is a technique designed to achieve a deep depth of field by blending or stacking several images taken only millimeters apart together. Nine. Each stacked shot is focused in a different spot, so the combined depth of field is deeper than the depth of field produced by any of the individual images. I know this sounds all complicated, but I'm going I'm to hopefully simplify it for you. Top line. Focus stacking allows. It allows generation of images, physically impossible with normal imaging equipment. Here we have, again, the same shot of the barbed wire. Okay. Let's say I wanted to get all, all the whole string of barbed wire in focus, every single barb you see there. That probably wouldn't be possible with just regular, a regular camera and a macro lens. But what if I were to take a picture of the first barb, then the second barb, then the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and somehow combine all those together so that all they're all in focus? That's focus stacking. That's done digitally with with uh, Photoshop, okay? Any of the, any of the other things I'm talking about here, folks, I can't get into any in, in detail on any one in particular, but YouTube. YouTube is a great resource for finding out how-tos on these different techniques. There is a technique you're inter interested in, Google it, look it up on YouTube, find out more information about how to use this, this um, technique. Now, here's a series of training a six image focus stacking of a tachinid fly. Okay. Here we have, a, I guess it's pronounced tachinid or tachinid. I don't know how it's pronounced. We have on the left the fly, its eyes are in focus, right? Look at the shot in the middle. Its butt, its rear end is in focus. Okay. But everything in the middle is out of focus. Okay. What did the photographer do? He took four more pictures that were be, he focused between the eyes and between the tail and got six images that were all in focus, stacked them together, and got the image on the right. Okay? He did this with Photoshop. So he took six images, six shots of this fly to get that image on the right. Now, there's nothing wrong with an image on the left. It's got eyes are in focus. It's Yeah, it's, it's a good photo. It's a good macro photo. But look at the, the one on the far right, okay? That shows all of the fly in focus. Now, you can't do that with a normal macro setup, a macro lens. So focus stacking is something you might want to look into if you're a little more advanced and you want to get into something like this. Now, Something you might need, piece of equipment to be able to do this kind of focus stacking is an mm -hmm. automatic focus stacking rail. This is actually driven by a motor. There's an app that goes on your phone. You can program this automatic focus stacking rail with your phone app and you tell it, okay, I want to take 10 images one millimeter apart. You press go. It will take the 10 images. It'll move the focusing rail one millimeter at a time. And then you have the 10 photos. Let's say I want to take five photos, five millimeters apart. You set it, go, it'll do the exact same thing. It'll take five photos, five millimeters apart. So this is something, I'm not sure what these cost. I've never used one myself. I don't actually do focus stacking myself. 
But if you want to get into focus stacking, you might want to get, get look into an automatic focus stacking rail like this. Right. Here's a website I just came across today while doing some research. It, it's about handheld focus stacked macro butterfly images. Now, I didn't really have time to read this article. There's the, there's the URL at the bottom, or you can Google it. But apparently, this photographer named Thomas Sturr has a technique he uses to handhold uh, photos he's going to be used for focus stacking. I'm not sure how he does this because you have to move this such short distances at a time. But he, he says, apparently came up with a way. You might want to check this out. Maybe it's a good article. It may have some tips you, you can use. Okay, now we're going to go into lighting. Top line. The problem of sufficiently. And evenly lighting the macro subject can be difficult to overcome. Difficult but not impossible if flashes are used. However, okay. in many cases, the. The camera's pop-up flash cannot be used in photography, in macro photography. Why not? Here we have an example. If your camera has a pop-up flash, you may want to consider getting something else for macro photography. Here we have somebody taking a photo of it looks like a cricket or a cockroach or something. I don't know. Notice how the beam of light does hit the cricket, but look at all that area right here between the between the cricket and the and the left front of the lens. That will be shadowed by the lens hood itself. So what else can you do? If you can't use your pop-up flash on your camera, what else can you do? Top line. To avoid this problem, many... Many photographers use flashes mounted directly on the front of their macro lenses, while others use flexible arms to get the light source closer to the subject. This is actually a setup that I used years ago. It's basically a Koken uh, ring flash that mounts to the front of the lens. And you can see those are three individual flashes that can be angled up or down. And this way, there's no problem with the lens blocking the flash because the flashes are between the lens and the subject. These are called ring flashes. Here we have another setup. This is a more modern setup. And I've seen people use this at, at the Butterfly Center. You have these arms, a, a flash attached at each end. You can then move those arms around to get the lighting you want, the angle you want, however close or further away you want from it, to get flash on your subject. Why do you need flash? Because when you're shooting macro, when you're shooting at a, at a uh, small aperture, even direct sunlight may not, may not be quite enough uh, light. You need a little extra light or you're in the shade or shadows or something. These kind of small flashes positioned as you need them can do the job for you. Top line. Some photographers macro. Macro flash setups are a bit less sophisticated than others. Okay. Here we have a homemade setup somebody made using duct tape, using index cards, using a sock. I don't know what this guy used. This is not mine, folks. But it probably worked for him, you know. Doesn't look very good, but it probably worked for him. Oh, good morning coming up here, guys. Do not be seen in public using this setup. You don't want anybody to see you using this, okay? <laughs> you come to the Butterfly Center with that, I'm going to laugh at you. <laughs> then you'll show me your great pictures, and then I'll probably make my own setup just like it. But if it works for you, it doesn't have to be expensive. The thing is, try different things to see what works for you. More on macro photos. Here's a hairy caterpillar. Here's another fly. Another jumping spider. Isn't that cool? Look at those eyes. Look at those hairs on its face. Here he is, the same guy looking right at me. Now, here we have chrysalis. And the reason I'm showing you these two chrysalis is look at the background. One side is lit, one side is completely black. What's the difference? I'm allowing more ambient light to come in with the photo on the left by using less artificial light. 
or by opening up the lens to allow more ambient light in. Now, you may not want a, a, a macro photo with a completely black background. You may want that, but you have to experiment to see what works for you. Here we have a cicada skin, the same thing. Look at the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. See how it goes from dark to green? That's because in the first couple of photos, I use a strong flash, or I had my lens stopped down where very little ambient light came in. So it was only the flash was the only light exposing this. On the lower two photos, uh, I had probably a wider aperture, a small, you know, more open um, diaphragm, allows more, af more uh, ambient light to come in. I'm now getting lighting on the background, not from my flash, but from the existing light. Okay, I think this looks more natural, but you know, it's up to you. Okay, now here, here we're coming to another section, uh, cropping your existing close-up photos into macros. You may already have taken some great macro photos and not even realized it. Close-up photos can be turned into macro photos. How? Top line. In some cases, you can turn your existing close-up photos into macros simply by cropping. However, the more drastic the cropping, the sharper and higher resolution the original images need to be. If you have a photo that's not exactly very sharp or is a low resolution, you crop it and it's going to show up even worse, okay? Here's some examples of close-up photos I turn into macro photos. Here's a tropical leaf wing. I cropped out most of it and left the face and left the proboscis. Now, this is not quite as sharp as I'd like it to be. That eye could be a little bit sharper. Here we have a zebra heliconian. Now, the wing is, is blurry not because it's not sh sharp. It's because it was, it, was it was flapping its wings. That movement caused that. But look at the eyes, okay? I like this photo, but let's, let's zoom in a little closer. Here we go. And here we go, okay? This is the exact same photo, just that I cropped away the majority of it and left only the face and the legs and the body. But I shoot at high resolution or I shoot in raw. Uh, this is something that more professional photographers know about. Um, I shoot in high resolution and I only try this when I know it's sharp enough to do. Here we have a queen. You can see how much I, how much more of a macro it is by cropping. Here we come even closer. Look at that. This is the this is the before. This is the after. I turn this picture on the left to the picture on the right, simply by cropping away the majority of the image. Here we have a Gulf Fritillary, all covered in dew. We have the before on the left. Cropped on the right, cropped again, and cropped again. Now the one on the far on the right here is not quite as sharp as I'd like it to be. The one on the left here I do like. The eye looks a little bit sharper, but you can tell the difference in the sharpness just because I cropped it a little bit more. That's the original on the left, and that's the macro on the right. So if you have pictures like that one on the left there, try turning them into macros by cropping. Here we have, um, I believe it's a queen also, looking at me. And they got the one on the left, the one on the right, I cropped. I cropped it again, and I cropped it again. The same photo, before and after. So I'm turning a close-up photo into a macro photo just by cropping. Now, you need software to do this. Now you can, there are some softwares you can get online, you can download for free. There's one called Irfan View, I-R-F-A-N-V-I-E-W. I believe that's a free one. They ask you for a donation, but you don't have to pay it if you don't want. But there's one program, that's not what I use. I use Lightroom, uh, which is a more, it's made by Adobe. It's a more professional software that, that's, that, that's more expensive. That's what I use to process and crop my photos. But if you want to look, look, do a Google search and find something program that will allow you to crop your photos. But 
shoot in high resolution and make sure they're sharp first. Here we go, damselfly, okay? Hold on, I'm gonna go back to this one. Here we go, I like the shot on the left, it's interesting, but look at the one on the right. Look at those eyes, look at the, ha the hairs on the legs and all that, that's, that's an excellent photo that I produced just by cropping a close-up. Here we have a spider. This is not even a close-up, okay? So, okay, I wasn't able to get any closer. Here we go, not bad. Here we go again. This one, maybe I overdid a little bit. This is not as sharp as I like. I probably would have stuck with this one here, okay? But here, here we have, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back to this. Here we have, I thought I had a before and after shot. That's the before. That's the after, okay? Cropping. Here we have a tarantula hawk. If you all aren't familiar with tarantula hawks where you live, we have them here in South Texas. From what I understand, it's the second, second most painful bite of any insect or sting, I guess it is, of any insect in the world, second only to the bullet ant. Fortunately, they're not aggressive. They won't bother you if you don't bother them. But this is a uh, tarantula hawk feeding on banana brew at the National Butterfly Center. Now, I like that shot, and the blue is caused by the sun, the light hitting it. They're normally black, but sometimes you get their lighting just right, and they have this iridescent blue color, okay? Now, watch what's going to happen to that after I crop it. Isn't that cool? This opens a whole new world. You look at things differently once you start getting to macro photography. Okay, maximizing depth of field. It's actually not maximizing. It's actually more like working around shallow depth of field, okay? Top line. With the extremely shallow depth of field, you have to work with the macro photography. There is one way of getting your entire subject in focus. How is that? Top line. Top line. That is to have as much of the subject on the same focal plane as or parallel to your camera's image sensor. Hmm. Yeah. Here's a, a damselfly. How did I get it all in focus? Every part of that damselfly and every part of that stick it's on is on the same focal plane as my image sensor. So shallow depth of field doesn't matter because all of it falls within that shallow depth of field. If it was a face shot, where I'm looking at its head on or at a slight angle, some of it would be in focus, some would be out of focus. So if you can get these profile shots like this and get every part of your subject in the focal plane, you can get it entirely in focus. Here's another fly. Here's uh, some kind of assassin bug, I think, I'm not sure. Here we have another damselfly. Notice here, the entire damselfly is in focus. But look at the stick it's on. It's in focus up to past its eyes. At that point, it's kind of angling away. You can tell it's getting blurry. Why? Because it's moving away from the focal plane. It's not within the same focal plane. So getting your subject entirely within the same focal plane will allow you to get it all in focus. I believe this is a small tail caterpillar. And we have some kind of a, it's a true bug. I forget what kind it is. Uh, it's all in focus, maybe not its legs, look at its legs, its feet, but the body's all in focus, even the antennas are in focus, why? Because they're on the same focal plane. Here we have a robber fly on the left, and we have an egg sac, a spider egg sac on the right. The robber fly, the stick it's on, everything's in focus. The egg sac, is webs, everything's in focus, same focal plane. Okay, here's a little... We're finishing up here, folks. Making your macro shots re-macroable. Okay, top line. Look for small, but... Interesting subjects that will stay long enough for you to get up close and personal. It helps to have an interesting subject to begin with, okay? Then you zoom in on it or get close enough to it to get photos like this. And that makes all that much more interesting, okay? This is an orb weaver with an egg sac. And look at that web it, it wove. It's all in focus. Why? It's all in the same plane. 
interesting subject, looking it up up close and personal, much closer than people normally will look at it, and you'll see something, you'll get a wow shot. Flowers don't have to be insects. They can be flowers. They work too. Droplets. This was right outside the back door of the visitor's pavilion of the National Butterfly Center. Uh, I don't know if they had just turned on the sprinklers or, or what happened, but I saw all these little water droplets all over the grass. And those are really interesting. So I took some pictures. Look at how they're all in focus all the way across. Why? They're all in the same focal plane. Now look at this. Okay. Isn't that interesting? You have these, these, uh, these droplets, and you're seeing a reflection. You're seeing the image behind them through it. And... To me, this is really fascinating to be able to do this. It's an interesting subject that I got close enough to to make it even more interesting. Top line. Does this mean you cannot take macro photos of butterflies, bees, or other flying creatures? Not at all. You've already seen photos I've taken of bees and butterflies and so on. However, You need, to, you need to kind of get lucky with these kind of photos because you need to get, what I usually do is, for example, the Belize is a silver emperor. I took photos of it and photos of it, all different angles and so on. I said, well, this, this silver emperor is not moving. It's, it's like, it, it's oblivious to me. So I'm going to see how close I can get. So I'll get closer to it, take pictures, get closer to take pictures. Before you knew it, I was right in his face. Look at, look at the proboscis, look at the eyes, look at the hairs, look at all that. I was able to get so close to this silver emperor that I got I got this shot. I already got this shot from a distance, so get those shots first, and then try moving in. If your if your butterfly, the subject lets you, take the macro shots. Here's another macro shot. Same thing with this butterfly. I started further away. I saw hey, it was so engrossed in either eating or what it was doing. They didn't seem to mind me being around, so I got closer, took some shots, got closer, took some more shots. I even probably switched out lenses, went from my regular or my telephoto lens to my macro lens, and said, you know, still able to get these shots. Look how much more interesting this photo is by getting this close and personal with it. Here we have a metal mark. I'm not sure if it's a curved wing, red, maybe a red border metal mark. Look at the, the granules of pollen on it. Look at the eyes, okay? I was able to get this shot similar way. I started further away, got closer, closer, closer. Take lots of photos. I always say that in my workshops. When For those of us who used to use film, every photo we took cost us money. We had to buy the film. We had to have it processed. Every photo cost us money. With digital, photos do not cost you money. You can take 100 photos of the same subject, keep the best one, delete the rest. That's how you get wow shots. You increase your odds by taking multiple photos. Here's a bee, honey bee. Here we go again. Here's another one. These are all done with just a macro lens, maybe extension tubes. I'm not sure exactly you know, what I used on these particular photos, but I got as close as I could, got the eyes in focus, yeah. The majority of the butterfly is out. I mean, the majority of the bee is out of focus. I don't care. I got the eyes in focus. That's what matters. What if I had gotten the wings or the legs or whatever in focus and the eyes were out of focus? I would have deleted that. Top line. Macro, macro photography of insects, arachnids, and other small wildlife can be very rewarding. However, Taking photos such as these you've seen here tonight requires patience, practice, and persistence. As some of you know, uh, attending my workshops in the past, I call this the three Ps of wildlife photography, patience, practice, and persistence. If you have the three Ps, you will succeed. If you don't, chances are you won't. Okay. There's the end. Thank you, folks. Oh, I'll stick around for a little while. It's been great, Luciano. Oh, such beautiful, amazing pictures.
And I think we all should applaud for Linda helping to uh, uh, to do that first line. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, no, next time that... I do this, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Okay, so I We're stopped so sharing. We're just glad you could come. Uh, yeah, if you want to stop sharing the screen and we'll take a few questions. Uh, I see that, uh, I think Susan had her hand up first, if you want to take some of the questions. Uh, Susan, go ahead and unmute. Uh, Susan Potter, did you want to ask a question? Anybody? Uh, no, right. no, I don't. Thank oh, okay. you. Okay, sorry. I thought you had a hand up. Thank you. Anyone else have a question for our fine speaker? Oh, you took such wonderful pictures. And I got texts, all kinds of texts, Luciano, about how well you were explaining things. That was much appreciated. You're welcome. I was trying to stay somewhere where I had a little something for everybody, for the beginners <laughs> to the more advanced. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, well, I don't see uh, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Um, I, this is fascinating listening to you tonight. And I wonder, you know, I do a lot of, photography too and in post-processing where a lot of the picture takes place and I'm using Lightroom too I wondered if you've used the Topaz software at all with your PA. no I have not used Topaz is, is, is that the one that removes the the sound I mean the yeah makes them sharper basically uh, I've never used it I've seen ads for it on Facebook but I've, I've never actually used it yeah, I have started using that. It removes noise it, or well, grain. It removes, yeah, noise, it sharpens. Right. Uh, and it does several things. They now combine all into one. And, and as I've started using it, I'm having to go back and redo every macro photograph I've ever taken. Wow. Every picture I've taken of butterflies, I've had to go redo every one of them. It is at the auto intelligence of that software has completely changed my attitude toward my camera, my sensor, how I take pictures. Virtually everything I do now is absolutely incredible. I don't even own stock in the company. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Okay, yes, well, I'm I'll, sure. I'll definitely, definitely look into that. I know Lightroom does have a feature where you can remove some of the noise. Because yeah. um, I, I also do sports photography and sometimes right. shooting in low light conditions. Uh, you know, I do have that issue. So I'll definitely lo look into the topaz. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Yeah. Anybody else have a question for Luciano? Thank you so much for being here tonight. All right. Thank you all for being here. And Luciano, thank you for a very fine presentation. We've gotten lots of compliments in the chat and in texting that I'm getting. It's great to have so many members and so many chapters represented. And I neglected to say that Edie Toussaint is also with us and she's one of our staff people with NABA. If you're interested in supporting the National Butterfly Center or some of the other NABA programs like butterfly monitoring or butterfly gardens and habitats, let me know. We also have a really exciting project in South Florida right now where we're doing a habitat restoration near the Everglades. And if you're interested in learning how you can support some of our programs and some of our activities, be sure and let me know. You have my email address and my phone number and uh, let me know. So thank you all. Our, the most we had attend tonight, uh, we've, this is the most attended presentation that we've done. And so we're really exciting to, to, excited to see it. Thank you all and have a great night.